Welcome to Walking Through the Word. I am Josiah Espinoza. Today we will be reading John chapter 5, verse 19 through 29. So if you have your Bibles, open them up with me as we walk through the Word together. Uh, Last time we talked about the man who had been lame or paralyzed for 38 years. And Jesus walks up to him, directly to him. And he knew that he had been lame for a long time. And Jesus, by his grace and by his sovereign mercy, heals the man. And he tells the man to pick up his bed and to walk. And immediately the man walks away. And Jesus, not wanting to draw crowds, not wanting the miracle to uh, cause a stir of the people, um, ends up leaving quickly. Uh, Because the Jews see the man walking with his bed and they ask him, hey, why are you carrying your bed on the Sabbath? Um, Don't you know that it is against the law to walk with your bed on the Sabbath? And the man says, "Um, somebody healed me. And they ask him, well, who told you to take up your bed and walk? And the man said, I don't know. (laughs) Because he didn't know. He didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus had just withdrawn from the crowds as quickly as possible. But afterwards, Jesus finds the man, and he says to his, See, see, look what I have done for you. Make sure you don't sin anymore, that nothing worse would happen. So the man ended up going away, and the Jews persecuted Jesus because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus says something that is very difficult for him to say. But it says in verse 17, My father is working until now, and I am working. So Jesus makes himself equal with the Father. Jesus says that on the Sabbath, the Father is working. So on the Sabbath, I am working. And last time we talked about this, the reason that Jesus works on the Sabbath is because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the creator of the universe. And Jesus is not bound by temporal time, by temporal limitations. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And remember that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. So Jesus becomes the true Sabbath. But the reason, but because he said this, because he said, my father is working until now and I am working. The Jews wanted to kill him all the more because he was breaking the Sabbath. And not only that, but he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God. So the way that Jesus says, my father is working until now and I am working, the Jews understood this as Jesus making himself equal to God. And if you notice, in the following verses, Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I didn't mean I'm not equal with the father or I am not equal to God. If anything, he makes it worse according to the eyes of the Jews. But for us... We can at least know Jesus is making himself equal to God. So don't let anybody tell you that Jesus never intended to be called God. Of course he is God. Of course he intended for people to know that he was God. For God was supposed to come down. It was prophesied that God would be amongst them. That Emmanuel, God with them, would be there. And Jesus is making proclamation after proclamation throughout the Gospels that he is indeed not only the Son of God, but God in the flesh. Look at what he says in verse 19. So Jesus said to them, well, who is them? Them are the Jews who are persecuting him, who are looking to kill him because he is making himself equal to God. And notice he doesn't say, no, I didn't mean to make myself equal to God. If anything, he says, truly, truly, which uh, in Jewish writing, if you want to emphasize something, you will repeat it twice. So Jesus is saying, this is true about me. This is absolutely true about who I am, about the nature of the relationship between me and my father. This is what Jesus is saying. And listen to what he says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. So what he says is, I don't do anything apart from my Father. Whatever my Father is doing, I am doing. This is why they said to him, or that's why they were going to kill him, because he was making himself equal to God. Jesus is saying, 
whatever I see my father doing, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm doing what my father is doing. We're one in our action. We are one in our will. It says, for whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And you might say to yourself, well, aren't we supposed to be doing the things of God as well? I mean, it's not too crazy to say that I do the will of my father. I do the will of God. Yeah, but the emphasis of what Jesus is trying to say is everything that the father does, I do. And this is not something the Christian can say. I cannot say I do everything God does. That everything I see God doing, that's what I am doing also. There's no way any human person can be can say that in truthfulness. Only Jesus, because Jesus is one with the Father. And Jesus is God in the flesh. Verse 20 says, For what the for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. Verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Now this is important because as a Reformed theologian, I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit, they all work unanimously and unitedly in raising people to spiritual life, people who are spiritually dead by their sovereign grace. It is by their will that they bring dead people to life. And you're going to see this all throughout the book of John. We have noticed several verses that have already talked about this. In John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it's not man who wills himself to be born of the Spirit, but it is God who uh, wills the one to be born of the Spirit. And again, in John chapter 3, in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. Just as God is free, so the Spirit is free to, br- to blow life into people, to, pe- to bring people into spiritual life. And nobody can tell it where to go or how it's going or where it's going. Nobody can understand the movement, the free blowing of the Spirit. But the Spirit does, in fact, give life to whom He pleases. And He does so according to his sovereign grace. Then we see Jesus approaching the Samaritan woman. Nothing about the Samaritan woman was uh, good enough for Jesus to approach her, but Jesus, by his sovereign grace, approaches her and uh, prophesies about her lifestyle, and it so moves the Samaritan woman that she becomes a tool for the Lord. She becomes... Uh, someone who is used to preach the gospel. Then we see again Jesus' sovereign hand in healing the paralyzed man, the man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. Now Jesus says something extremely profound here in verse 21. He says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so he, he kind of starts with uh, in, in, in a very important uh, starting principle. The Father raises the dead and gives them life. Just as the Father raises the dead by His power, by His sovereignty, God raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son. He's saying, my power is equal to the Father's power. The power that my Father has in in bringing people to life, not just physical life, but spiritual life, because the Spirit is the one who's blowing. It is the Spirit that testifies of the Son, as we're going to see in later chapters, in John, John chapter 14 and 15, where the Spirit is working in unison with the Son and the Father. He's saying, just as the Father has power to raise the, life, uh, raise the dead and give them life, Jesus says, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. And it's not according to the person's will but according to the Father's will and according to the Son's will. The Son wills 
whom he will raise from the dead and give them life. Verse 22, the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. And you might say, well, I just, I thought you just said that Jesus and the father are one. So how is it that the father is not judging anybody, but Jesus is judging? Well, you have to understand that the father is giving authority to the son. He's not saying that we're no longer one in these decisions of judgment, but rather that the Son and the Father are so unanimously tied with one another. They're so united. They're so one in their being and in their will and in their actions and in their character that whatever this ju the Son judges, that the Father is allowing the Son to judge whomever the Son wills to judge. And how does the Son judge? Um, the, the son judge according to those who will not believe and according to those who will believe, as we'll see in a minute. So the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. So the father in his power gives judgment over to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. And he goes on to say, whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father. So people might say to you, you don't, you don't need to believe in Jesus. You don't need to honor Jesus to be um, in the Father's will. You can do much other things and still be in the Father's will. But here plainly it says that if you honor the Son, if you honor Jesus and you believe in Jesus, then you are honoring and believing in the Father because they are one. For whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 24, truly, truly, again, repeating the same word. He's emphasizing this as absolute truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And this is the life that Jesus wills by his sovereignty, by his grace, he wills people. Just as the Father raises dead people to life, so the Son gives people life. By how? By believing. How do they believe? They believe by the Father and the Son and the Spirit working in, in total sovereign graciousness to bring spiritually dead people to life. People who hate the Son, people who hate the light, people who are dead in their sins, they are working together in a magnificent way, in an extremely profound way to bring people to spiritual life. In verse 25, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And this is important. We know that the word says that um, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So it's not so crazy to say that it is a miracle when people come to spiritual life by the hearing of the word of God. Now, the thing we might ask ourselves, does everybody who hears the word believe? Does everybody who hears the voice or the words of the scriptures come to spiritual life? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Not everybody who hears the word comes to spiritual life. But the scriptures always te also tells us that God's word does not come back void and never fails to accomplish that which the Father and the Son and the Spirit intends. So if the word goes out to the masses and there are a group of those people who truly repent, who truly believe, those are the ones whom the Son has willed to raise from spiritual life or spiritual death to spiritual life but for the rest who stay in their hard-heartedness jesus does not have to save they are dead in their sins they want nothing to do with the gospel if given every opportunity they will spit in god's face and reject the gospel and so we must ask ourselves so then why do we preach why do we teach because god is glorified Simply in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit God is glorified in the preaching of the crucified and mutilated Son. And because we are commanded to go, and because we love people, we go. But God is sovereign in His 
raising of the spiritually dead. Verse 26, 4. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also the, to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And I've talked about this before. The title Son of Man is not a title of the human nature of God. It is a divine title. It is a title of the coming reign of of the Son of Man, the coming reign of God, when God establishes His kingdom finally and forever on the earth, the title that is given to the person who has come to inaugurate the kingdom in the book of Daniel is given the title Son of Man. And so when Jesus speaks of Himself as the Son of Man, He's not basically saying, I was born of a man, or I was born of a woman, or I was born of humanity. That's not what he's making a reference of. What he's saying is, as the Son of Man, I am the divine future king of the established reign of God. That's what Jesus is proclaiming himself to be. And the Jews know exactly who he is claiming himself to be. Just as the Jews are recognizing that he is making himself equal to God, now he is making himself equal to the coming Messiah, the coming uh, reign, the coming king, the one who is going to establish the reign of God on the earth. Verse 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus proclaiming himself to be the future king of the world, the one who is going to inaugurate the kingdom says that everyone who has died, who everyone who is in their tombs figuratively, who have died physically and are spiritually either in the presence of God or in a hell right now, every single one who are in the tombs are going to raise from the dead. Everybody is going to be raised from the dead. And in the raising of the dead, Jesus is going to judge those who have done good to enter into an everlasting life and those who have done evil into everlasting judgment. And that's what the Bible teaches. Hell is the eternal place of torment. A place where you were consciously in your pain and suffering because of the sins that you have committed both now and forever. They have eternal consequences. And if you do not repent and believe in the Son, who is God in the flesh, who will be the coming reign, who will be the coming king, the one who will establish the reign of God on earth. If you do not believe in him, you will suffer eternal condemnation, eternal judgment, eternal hell. So I pray, I pray that these words that you are hearing, that you would not just shove them and spit in God's face. I pray that you would hear these and that you would turn and that you would repent and that you would believe on the only Son of God, the one who died for sinners, the one who gave his life, that whoever believes in him, all that would believe in Jesus would have eternal life. I pray that you would join me next time as we finish John chapter 5. This is an extremely awesome book. I love this book and it only gets better and better as we go through the book of John. So I pray that you were blessed by this message. Uh, may the, the sovereign grace of God be eternally upon you, uh, sanctifying you, working in you to complete faith and endurance and perseverance uh, brothers and sisters be blessed make sure that you subscribe to my youtube channel i would greatly appreciate it share this message to the your friends to your family to the whole world that way we can get souls into the kingdom of jesus god bless you guys